All right, very good. Welcome everyone. Howdy, it's Rick Clark with the uh, Farm Green Podcast. Uh, we're in for a treat tonight, Mr. Ray Archuleta. We uh, we're going to get down under his skin tonight, and we're gonna we're gonna look at some past history, some present, and where he thinks we might be headed in the future on some things. So this is going to be an absolute blast. I Ray needs no introduction from me. Um, so giddy up, let's go. Ray, I'm going to ask you the same question I ask everybody, and and just so everyone remembers. Ray and I have not talked. He has no idea what I'm going to ask him, but uh, this is the one thing that he does know, this one question. Ray, what is on your mind right now? Like the last 24, 48 hours, what's on your mind? Well, first, thank you, Rick, for having me. I really appreciate it. It's fantastic. I'm so glad. First, I'm honored to, to know you, and we've had uh, a lot of times to teach and go all over the place. and And also, I want to thank for all the participants, just for you guys to spend your time here. There's two things that people always want to hold on real tightly to, is their money and their time, and their time is even more precious. So I hope this is beneficial that we can share. You know, the things that come to my mind, and I've been thinking about this a lot, Rick, is, you know, when you drive like you and I do and we travel, and yeah. I, I, I travel through the whole country, and I mean, you and I put a lot, a lot of miles flying, yep. Gabe Brown does that, all of us. And I think that always comes up to my mind. I said, how can it be that something so simple, like covering the soil, covering the land, that could create such an incredible benefit uh, from, from a health-wise to a climate-wise to, to uh, water quality-wise? I mean, all the benefits that you can see by just covering the soil with a living plant and yet, we humans have such a struggle with that. Why do we struggle to understand that basic concept that we covered the soil? And the soil wants this uh, most precious thing. I, I tell people, soil wants three things from us. One, to have relationship, understand it. Two, cover it with a living plant and an animal, grazing animal. It's pretty simple. But yeah. yet, as I travel the whole country, I see a lot of bare soil and still... A uh, lot of erosion and, you know, the struggles that we have to regulate our climate. My biggest thing is I think about as I drive across, why do we struggle with such a simple concept of just keeping the ground covered? And we make it, as humans, make it very complex. Well, let's just go, let's just stay right there then. What, what, what I'll give you my thoughts on it, but let's start with yours. Why, why do you think that's so? Well, well me personally, I've been... My own personal opinion is, um, it's human nature. Really, it's humans. It's how we look at it. It's social conditioning. I begin to realize that the biggest problem on the farm and ranch is the hardest surface is between the years, and me included. We were all, Rick, uh, conditioned a certain way. We were conditioned at home. Mm -hmm. We were conditioned at church. We were conditioned at the university. We were uh, not only we were indoctrinated, we were we went through this social conditioning. And that's why for many years I started using those soil demonstrations to break up that conditioning, that paradigm. It's the way we look at the natural system. We're not very good with relationships. We're yeah. good with creating distinction, but we're not good with relationships. And relationships is ecology and, and connectness with the land. It's relationship. And humans don't do really well with relationship, in my opinion. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I'm going to probably just piggyback right on top of that. It's, it's the fact of uh, that's how we've been taught to farm. We're, we're not willing to change, or if we are willing to change, who's going to teach us. I mean, we're going to talk a lot about a lot of this later on in this program, but, yeah. but you know, Ray, we are short of teachers. I mean, understanding ag is doing a great job getting their folks yeah. out and, and and we need more of that because right. there are millions of acres, millions of acres, and we need we need the teachers in place so that that this can be a successful journey. And that's what this is—a journey, you know. So, yeah, yep. Uh, one of the things I want to state, Rick, I think that we have to make it very clear that um, our Western culture uh, was really from the Greeks and Romans, and it was very reductionist and reductionist science is very powerful. Uh, we couldn't go to the moon. We couldn't do build a car. Reductionist science is this, you break things up into little pieces. 
but it's horrible when it has to deal with the living ecosystem or the human body. So that's called holistic science, more kind of to see the big picture. Yeah. And so what school did for me for eight years, it kind of it taught me how to reduce things. But what happens, it didn't teach me how to understand relationships and what's going on and how to connect the dots. So that I think we have to uh, realize that as that it's our framework of thought process. Uh, and I think that's critical. Yeah. Um, so let me let's go back. I, I, I like to go back and, and come forward. Um, let's go back to. First of all, what made you decide, Ray, that, you know what, I'm going to go to college and tell us where you went to college and, and why you studied what you did study? Okay. Uh, thank you, Rick. I, I grew up in this little town of, of Española, New Mexico. I grew up, our family's been there for four or 500 years in New Mexico. So I went to, wow. was raised there and I worked on my uncle's ranch and I loved being outside. And I said, oh my goodness, I want, I want to be in, in agriculture. So I went and got an associate's up in the Northern New Mexico Community College. I went to a four-year degree in New Mexico State University, and then went to graduate school. And um, agriculture, I just loved being outside. Yeah. I love working with the natural system. So that's what got me going. And I, I had a passion for that. And so I told my dad, that's what I'm going to do. I knew since 15 years old that that's what I was going to do. That's crazy. See, most people, I mean... 19 year olds don't know what they want to do or 21 year olds. So that's great. You had that vision and that, that yeah. drive. So go ahead. Well, and it's kind of like, uh, I think that all of our lives, Rick, and I think all the participants can appreciate this. All of us went through, I call this butterfly, of, uh, I call this blood, butterfly events. Like one little tiny thing can change the directory of your whole life. Uh, sixth grade for me, my dad said, you're going to go to a private school changed my whole life. Marrying my wife's son and you met Sonia changed my whole life. I, I don't think people realize the tiny little things in your life make a difference. The people you come in contact when you and I met, when I met Gabe, all mm -hmm. those little tiny butterfly effects can change a tornado of effect of your whole life. So uh, everything does matter and everybody you come across matters. So that's what I began to realize those tiny little events can create a huge thing. Yeah. All right. So you've got you've got your education. You're now being you're being trained to be what a soil scientist and and you're being trained from academia academia's point of view, correct? Yes. I, I went to agronomy, uh, agronomy, entomology, and uh, minor in entomology and in, in fact in, in soils in graduate school. So I was taught uh, conventional agriculture. What I was taught, Rick, this is what I was, the paradigm. It's all about yield. It's about controlling the diseases, the pests. It was yeah. all about control. It was about forcing. It was about all about yield. But not one professor, not one person told me, said, Ray, focus, focus. I want you to look. The goal is to emulate nature's designs, patterns, and principles. Not one person taught me that, Rick. Right. And and I went through my whole career in NRCS. It was all about yield. That's what I was taught. Mm -hmm. And and so I went through a, a severe paradigm shift about 15, 16 years ago. Well, you see, I I look at you, Ray, as as this scientist in academia, and then I look at me as this farmer who's been trained from not only academia, but my father and his father, that we have to be mass disruptors of the soil. We've got to kill everything in sight or this isn't going to yeah. work. And then all yeah. of a sudden we somehow, both of us make this shift to just say, you know what, this isn't working anymore. We've got to make a change. Now, Ray, mine was a defensive mechanism. Tell me what, what was it that made you say, I've had enough and this is, this is not going to work. It was, I know the exact time. I was a district conservationist in Oregon and I lived in the Idaho side and I was responsible for a, a district office. I was a district conservationist. I'll never forget, Rick. I had a small 11 acre farm and I would come home every day. And I will tell you, I started hating agriculture. Here's a kid that loved agriculture and I started to hate it. Mm -hmm. I started to hate it. And I started to hate it because... I could see that farmers were going broke and we weren't cleaning the water. We were spending billions and billions of dollars and I was getting very, very depressed, almost to a point 
I didn't even want to work for NRCS anymore. I just didn't see hope, yeah. you know? And so I started saying, something is wrong. I, and nobody can answer. I said, how come we can't make a living? Why can't farmers make a living on 500 acres and, and bring their son and daughter on 500 acres? I just could not understand that. And it bothered me. Right. It was then, and the, and the butterfly effect was reading Alan Savory's book, that mm. mode of depression in the 40s, when I was 40 years old, and going to Gabe's ranch in 2007, then my epiphany changed. I realized that I had it all wrong. A majority yeah. of the stuff I was taught. Yeah, I had a paradigm so, shift. Yeah, so that was right around the two seven, 2007 timeframe. Um, yeah. So how, how long... Okay, so how much longer did you stick it out with um, uh, USDA, NRCS, and then decide, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang my shingle up, I'm done. Uh, when did you step away? Uh, 14 years. I've, I've worked 14 more years. And it was interesting, Rick. It was kind of a blessing because I got, a, I got promoted to North Carolina and I got to be on the, on the National Soil Quality Team. And I didn't even know what that meant. That's how embarrassing it was. I didn't know what that meant. And then going to North Carolina, my, I could see that the whole journey of my life was planned because if I hadn't gone to North Carolina, I wouldn't have met Rick. Uh, I wouldn't have met, well, I wouldn't have met you, but I, I wouldn't have met uh, Ray Styers. And Ray Styers was the first one that taught me about rolling cover crops. And Ray has been rolling cover crops since the 1980s. Yeah. And that's crazy. And, and so it was crazy. He's been doing that for since the 80s. And I went to met him and I got and we and I would work together and roll cover crops with him on the weekends. And I would create PowerPoints of him and I would share his PowerPoints all over the place because these soils were six and a half percent organic matter. He hadn't been using fertilizer, no nitrogen fertilizer for years, just mm. manure and, and cover crops and no till. Yeah. See that that your journey is so similar to mine and many other people's journey. It's very similar. Um, you just reach that boiling point where it's like, you know, I, I, this isn't working. I mean, yeah, we were making some money, but we were just, it was mass destruction and, and it was time for a, a big change. So, all right. So now let's talk a little bit about, let's talk about your final years with, with NRCS because I'm sure, and, and if you don't want to talk about this, that's fine, because I understand, again, we've not prepped any of this, folks. Um, yeah. How difficult was that, Ray? Because you were starting to be, <laughs> you know, you're the one guy in the room. You're, you're that big elephant now in that room that's trying to stand in the corner. Everybody, everybody sees you over there. So how, how'd that play out? Well, uh, let me tell you, I'm glad you brought that up because, look, I'm not a, it was a beautiful journey. It was very hard, I'm going to tell you. But before I say this, I'm going to share with the audience one th thing that really bothered me for a long, long time. There's nothing worse in life that you can go through your whole life and not know what the goal is, Rick. Yeah. And I think that's why I want to start off with that, because when I left Idaho, I really didn't know what the goal was. I didn't even know how to look at the natural system. I was very confused. I didn't know how to approach it. It was very frustrating. There's nothing worse in life that you don't know what the goal is. But, and it catapults right into NRCS because I really believe that there's a lot of, look, uh, there's a lot of people out there that mean well. I, I really think they mean well. They, they're they passionate. They really want to do the right thing. But when you don't have the right framework and you're interpreting the natural system in the wrong way, and that's what I tell people, look, if your knowledge is based on the wrong foundation, everything else is wrong. If, yeah. And that's why now I challenge everything. When it comes to the human body, when it comes to vaccine or it comes to any new science or anything, anything, if it does not glorify the human body or the natural system, I question it right off the top of the bat. So, how, so when I have that framework, keep in mind, I had that thought process. And when I started growing, not everybody sees that thing the same way. We've got to remember, everybody else has been indoctrinated. And then when you start bringing these things up, at first they said, you're an idiot, you're crazy. Luckily for me that the good Lord didn't make me very bright. So it didn't bother me when people were kind of laughing. I knew they were laughing at the back end because I started doing those demonstrations and they saw the effect and I was so impassioned. Yeah. 
Because yeah. look, look, this is what happened to me, Rick. When I understood, I go, ah, I started going, I went like, I get it. I get it now. Mm -hmm. And with that kind of passion, you have that kind of passion and you, you're willing to do whatever it takes to withstand all the criticism and everything. But here's what happened. It started being so effective that I was being asked to go speak throughout the country. My speaking budget for NRCS was spending on me was up to $50,000 a year because the wow. demand of soil biology and the excitement that we are able to share, it's, it became viral. It and they couldn't lovely. stop it anymore, Rick. Well, they couldn't stop it anymore, Rick. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, it got people just so excited. And it was not just me. There was a, it was a conglomerate of people working in synchrony that started this whole movement. It yeah. wasn't just me, but I was just like, wasn't going to let go, Rick. Yeah. I wasn't going to let go. Yeah. And whether I was going to be fired or sent to, uh, I tell people, well, if they fire me, send me to North Dakota. Well, let, they, they'll send me to North Dakota and I'll freeze up there. But that's, but the early ages, Rick, were tough. It was tough. Yeah. It wasn't easy. It was well, tough. You, know, you were, I mean, you were going against the grain, um, you know, you were saying things and proving things that we were not being taught in school. And yeah. it was just totally opposite of what, what we were taught, not only from school, but from our, our ancestors. And, and that's where this becomes a little dicey sometimes because we have to be careful that we're not, you know, we're not pointing blame to anybody. We're not putting any, anybody down for the way they farm. We're just trying to show them that there's other ways that they could maybe do a couple of things and add it to their cur current uh, arsenal and maybe make some small changes and then get comfortable right. with what's going on. So expand on that. Well, Rick, I'm, I'm going to put the blame right. I'm, I'm going to put blame. It was a me first. I had it wrong. Yeah. I, I had the wrong concept. I was taught wrong. I'm, it was, and, and to sit there and just kind of like, uh, you know, get negative about the past it happened it was yeah. it's just to be honest about it i always realize there's no growth until you realize that you have a problem and i always tell people once you acknowledge that you you are the problem then healing starts to happen and it happened but what really started causing a lot of problems was uh, there's a lot of ancestral corruption in in the lobbyists and i i really thought i was very naive rick i thought we were going to soil health was going to go up there and and Dr. And, and Chief White, David White was the chief at that time. He's going to sign the paper and we're going to go like an army and we're going to teach soil health to everybody. Boy, I was I naive. And David believed yeah. it. David White believed it. But but then the chief after that, they got a lot of pressure from the Fertilizer Federation to because they said, well, Ray, you're telling people you can farm without fertilizer. Yeah. And that got dicey. People wanted to um, shut me up about it. And I wasn't going to shut up about it because I said, I don't work for you. I work for the farmer and for the, and for the people and yeah. for the land. And so that's where it got dicey. It's all about money, Rick. And, and I started realizing I'm not going to be able to change the government. The government's going to change when the people like you and, and, the, far, and the people listening, they're going to change it. Mm -hmm. They all change it. It's not going to change from the top up. That's why I realized that. Yeah. So I, you already touched on this, but you don't, so now looking back, you know, you spent all that time, all that money, you went to undergrad, then you went to grad school, you came up, you worked for a government agency, you spent all those years, and then you flipped the switch and you realized that, that all this was, you know, pretty much wrong. And you're yeah. obviously, you're not, you, you probably were some bitter about that, but you're don't, you're not holding a grudge, right? I mean, I mean, that, no, that's kind of, no. I mean, you spent a lot of your life, though, tr doing what old traditional methods would be that, that you know, are not correct. I, I think we forget it's called growth. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Rick, remember how you farmed for many years? I, I love yeah. your story when you said you started conventionally, then you went to no-till, then you went to cover crops. Yeah. Uh, regenerative agriculture is a journey, and sometimes you had to do the wrong things in yeah. that whole journey and it's yeah. and it's okay it's yeah. okay I, yeah. I i'm good with all my mistakes all my problems what i what you and i are trying to do is 
circumvent that others don't make the mistakes and don't have to um, wait so long because sometimes because farming is so costly. We're, yeah. we're, we're there to try to save them, to change them so they don't have as many mistakes. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, we're just trying to give them information and and provoke thinking process, you know. Hey, yeah. you know what? You know, I, I, I caught a couple things that guy said, and I, I'm going to try those out, you know. And then that's what I always say, you know, you've got to listen to podcasts like this. You've got to go to conferences. You've got to understand the power of networking. I mean, it's powerful. And, oh, yeah. and yep, yep, it's yep. not just, it's like you said, Ray, it wasn't just you. You weren't the only one doing this. And yeah. I'm not, I mean, there's all kinds of people doing this. There's people we don't even know about yet doing this. So yep. that's what's yep. so great about all this too, is there's so much community and so much transparency that when we're asked to go speak somewhere, we go up on that stage and we, we pretty much lay it all out. I mean, we've, We've we've laid it all out, total transparency. Yeah, yeah, yep, and, yep, and, yep. I, and I and like that. It's refreshing. Yes, I think that and you, that beautiful word you use, Rick, community. Yeah. This is about if you if the farmers build these little communities where they work together, it will change their lives. Yep. We this is about community, and I tell people, look, I got maybe twenty. I'm sixty. I got mm -hmm. maybe twenty growing seasons in me. If the good Lord gives me them. 20. So that means if I have a good group of community guys that I, we can do our own research and demonstration and work together, we have 10 good guys. You can you can have 10 years in one year. That's why you and I talk about building community. Don't do this by yourself. Yeah. I tell yeah. people, don't do this by yourself. Conquer and divide and, and get yeah. to that goal a heck of a lot quicker. Um, yeah. Let's see what we got a question here, Ray, from uh, yep. Yep. Scott, Scott Sat Satterthwaite. I hope I got that right, Scott. Ray or Rick, taking cost share out of the equation, how much would either of you take to start? What would it take if some entity wanted to pay you for your ability to reduce flooding by managing a growing infiltration basin along with others? Not a walk in the door using strategic methods through hydrologic modeling. That's going to be a little bit out of my arena there. I think I think Scott's asking uh, how much would either of you take to start? So I guess he wants to hire us. Oh, oh, I'm not, oh. I'm not sure there. Well, I, here's the thing that um, one of the things I've uh, we've done, Rick, and you've done this. You know, uh, the other day I was in Minnesota and one guy asked me, Ray, can you consult? And people ask you all the time. I mm -hmm. said, I'd rather... I'd rather have a group of farmers bring me in to teach them and, and to learn how to look at things correctly and give them the right paradigms and then to build them there in the community. I think we can do that very cost effectively where people can yeah. share that burden of the financial being there. I've been arguing to get people like you and other people that are very well versed is to pay them well and have them go into these little communities and watersheds, these little watersheds yeah. to help them. And yeah. then start off with that paradigm and then build these mentoring teams, in these communities. I think it'd be very cost effective on how we can do that. Way cheaper than what cost share is spending. Look, I'll say this thing about cost share, Rick. Yeah. We have spent billions since 1935, billions in cost share and money and help in conservation. And water quality sediment is still the number one water quality problem in the United States. Yeah. We were supposed to eliminate that since the 1930s. That's where we're yeah. at. And you were right, you were right in the middle of all that when you were in our CS. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then uh, I see I see Scott said no as a farmer. What what is the I, I still I don't know if I really understand, Scott. Maybe you can clarify your question a little bit, help us out, Rick and I. Maybe yeah. we're missing the mark because, uh, yeah, because I don't neither one of us have it yet. But let's stay right here for a moment, Ray. If I was a municipality and my my part of my responsibility is to supply clean water to the community. I would be greatly concerned about how the farm uh, ground is being farmed around my water, my watershed, where I'm collecting that water for that community. And I don't think that's talked about enough. You know, we want to talk about carbon and, and, and carbon markets and all this, but we, we need to talk about water quality too. Yes, we do. And that's why that's why, like you said, that's why we, as a co-founder, we started Soil Health Academy 
and understanding ag and why you've been teaching all over. Why? The problem is an education issue. This is an education problem. And, you know, one thing, Rick, that I need to bring up, but the people don't realize that there was a scientist in Iowa made a comment. Even if we put cover crops and cover cropped all of Iowa, we would still not fix the water quality. And I really, quality uh, issue. And I thought about that. And I said, what do you mean by that? Then I said, you know what? He's right. I, I finally thought about this. Rick, here's the problem. It's not just cover crops alone will not solve the problem. Right now, we're applying way too much manure, too much fertilizer. And soybeans, you know, people don't understand. Soybeans leak nitrogenous nitrogen through that whole, through that whole season. And, and they have a very poor root system. And if you have millions of acres out there in soybean, you're putting manures, you're putting, a, we're over applying fertilizer by more than 50 to 100%. And it's not just cover crops alone that's going to f solve this problem. We're going to have to do some really good nutrient management. And yeah. now I feel like we have a good soil test that we can measure the organic nitrogen like the Haney test. That's mm -hmm. why I'm so excited about it. So now I understand what that researcher is saying. If we covered the land, it would help big time, but it won't be enough. And coming back to your, 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 your issue in the watershed, we told the state conservationists, it's about going into a watershed and – and teaching and educated, then bring the cost share along with it. Don't just throw cost share at it. It won't fix it. it won't this, fix is when, this is when you were with NRCS. Yep, yep. Yeah. Uh, e yeah. EQIP is a Environmental Quality Incentive Program. The concept of it was that you go in, it was beautifully written thought process. You go into a watershed, you're supposed to go and educate and train and, and then bring in the tools of cost share to change the management in that watershed and then measure it. The problem was that the goal was, it was always done from a reductionist perspective. They never really understood what the goal was. The goal was not cost share. The goal was not cover crops. The goal is not no-till. The goal is to emulate nature, period. That's the goal. And, and I, I get so frustrated when people, well, it's about no-till. No, it's a tool. People need to understand the difference between tools and process. No-till, uh, cows, those are tools. Mm -hmm. Conservation plan is a process. Nutrient management plan is a process. The goal is to emulate nature. Yeah. It's design, it's patterns. The principles that we talk about, Rick, are the patterns and principles that emulate that design. Right. That's the goal. Yeah. And I get we get lost. We get so lost between tools and and um processes yeah. we as humans yeah well and and you know our our first question is when you step into one of those meetings is well what, what are you going to pay me you know from the farmer's point of view what, what am i going to get paid here to do this well yeah that, that's what you know you've got that cart in front of the horse or we've got to get the education part first and then then let's step in and figure out if we're going to you know what the what the subsidies might be um yeah got a question here tim tim I think it's Tim Red. I'm not sure because I don't see all of Redder. Huh? Tim Redder. Maybe Tim, Tim Redder. Redder. Hey, Ray, any words of advice to us fellow NRCS field staff trying to spread the message on soil health and regenerative ag in a time where federal funds are limited and very competitive, especially since many producers are motivated by the almighty dollar? How about that one? Yeah. Oh, I got a good one. I'll, I'll show this story. This is true. You know what? We say that, but I'm, I, I, and you, Rick, and you, you and I have talked about this. Look, I am not for the whole net of people. I'm not. I'm for that one to 10%. And you'll be, and Rick and I have done this. We have talked, and I, I will tell you only one to 10% of the producers will ever get it. They'll get it at that time. Those are the ones I want to work with. I'm telling you, a salsa jar, an empty salsa jar glass with screen to do my aggregate stability test, an infiltration ring, and a soil thermometer, that's all I need, and a yeah. shovel. A and I can go work with, and a spade. You go talk to a producer, and you got their attention, you can tell, and you walk to the edge of the fence row, and walk to their field, and I said, look, this is the way you farm, and this, this way nature farms the way you farm. Look, you go impassioned well-versed in knowledge and how the soil works and how, and you know the goal, you will change your community. You will change your community, which will change the world. 
You don't need the money. You need somebody that cares, impassioned, well-read. I can tell that you're here. You're willing to spend your precious time. So mm -hmm. I'm gathering you're pretty well-versed. Mm -hmm. So you don't need the stinking money. But mm -hmm. that one person you teach, they'll watch him. And then you, Tim, you, uh, uh, Tim, you help him. You build community together and you build this nucleus of community together. You'll change the community. Yeah. Without the money I, I, that I really believe I've seen it, Rick. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Ray. Um, they've got to find that that one ambassador or that one leader yep. of that community and then work with them, help them any way they can. Now, I'll tell you, I go often and you've been to this state as, as much as I have, maybe more Wisconsin. Wisconsin has got these these farmer led groups, Ray. I think there's 40 of them now. And it yeah. is amazing what 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 Wisconsin is doing. There is no, you know, the the co the only competition I see in these groups is who can do what the quickest. You know, they're not trying to take land from each other. They're not trying to steal. They're not trying to do this. They're all headed for a goal, like you talked about earlier in the beginning here, and conquer and divide. I mean, these you've been there. You've probably helped set some of these up. So talk. Let's talk just yeah. a little bit about that. Oh, Tony Perrick. Tony. Yeah. One producer, an, another Rick Clark. Oh my goodness, he started, started, and he's been rolling covers for the last ten years or plus. And Marty Weiser, those two, yeah, they are they they're changing Wisconsin. Yeah. Oh my gosh, they're changing Wisconsin. And how did it start? They heard they heard me talk, or they heard Gabe, or one of us, and it started that way. And they changed, and then Tony started, and then others got it, and. And they started building community. You know what they do, Rick, that's really powerful is they build this community and they're changing. And guess what? They're not getting much help from the NRCS in Wisconsin. No. And I keep telling Tony, I said, Tony, you go beat the state con's door down and say, hey, look give what, us some money. Yeah. Look what we've done here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and look, look at you, Rick. You've been all over the country. Yeah. Oh, gosh, look at the, a, a person with passion can change the world. I, yeah. You know what, Rick? I, I used to think when somebody said, ah, one person can change the world, I'd laugh. I go, sure, sure. And I, you know, just to be positive, I believe it now. I really believe it. So Tim, one person, that's all you need. And you work yeah. with them. You'll yeah. change your whole community. Yeah, I agree with that. I totally agree with that. Um, you got another question here. I think this is from our good friend, Mitchell. In Iowa, Mitchell Hora, I believe. I don't know why. I don't see, I only see like two letters of the last name, but I assume it's Mitchell Hora. Right. Yeah, it is. The USDA is throwing a billion dollars of new money at this, what we're talking about right now, via these new grants. Uh, when you get elected president, which, you know, when, when I don't know when you're running. I didn't know about this, right? I didn't know you were running yeah. for president. But anyway, no. what would you do with that type of money? How, how, would, you, how would you implement that money, Ray? You know what? I'm going to tell you first, I'd be like Kennedy. They'd probably shoot me. So I never, I never make it. I played to serve one term. So there you go. Uh, here's the thing. Look, I got to talk, Mitch. I talked to the secretary of agriculture and I said, and we had, an, we were on a Zoom meeting. I said, look, if we were going to do one thing, one thing, I'd get rid of all the farm programs just to get everybody, I'd get rid of all the farm programs. I said, okay, we're going to pay $100 an acre to do covers, period. You're just going to cover the land. Cover it. If That's you, pretty simple, if you right? do a single, really single. And I said, single species, you get paid so much. If you do three or four or five species, you get so much. If you let it grow so tall, you get so much. And think about this, Rick. Satellite imagery, snapshot. Let me see your C labels. We're done. Cover mm -hmm. the whole plant, cover the whole country. We would see a change in the climate right away. We see water quality. We see major changes. And I bet you it'll be cheaper than what we're spending now, and we're not getting a we're not getting nothing out of it. Yeah, we need massive coverage of the land to stabilize the climate right now. People don't understand the climate. The reason we're having climate issues, it's not just carbon. The soil surface is hot. It's what is what's my saying? The soil is hungry. It's hungry because it doesn't have enough living plant. It's thirsty because the water is running off too much tillage, not enough aggregation. It's running a fever because there's too much heat being reflected up into the atmosphere, pushing the rain clouds away. 
too much humidity in the air. And, and, and so, and it's, and it's starving, it's naked, it's hungry. And then the whole problem is cover the dang ground. If I got the dollars, I said, look guys, no more cost share. We're gonna pay you to cover the darn ground. And we're gonna, that's what we're gonna do. And what, guess what? They'll make more money than some of the, what they're making in the crops. Well, sure. That's I mean, point. if you pay, if you go with your idea of a hundred bucks an acre, that's more than enough to cover the seed cost and to get it in the ground and let alone the benefit coming on the backside of reduced inputs and and yield maintained, if not yield increased. So it's right. all and it's all win win. And see, people want to go with carbon, and they said, "Look, that every, that train's already gone past, and everybody's going to go down that path." It's look, people don't understand about carbon. Look, do you know that carbon in the soil, Rick? It can be a solid phase. Mm -hmm acaceous phase and it could be a liquid phase all at one time right one time think about how complex that is and we're going to say we're going to measure that and pay you for that well, it's ray, a gas yeah hey no i don't mean to cut you off but ray i no, need but, i i ask this to everybody i i don't understand where what is the device that measures this accurate accurately repeatedly and cheaply what what is that device do you know yeah and that's the whole point i think that we're I don't think the science is there yet, no. and it's it's expensive. It's expensive. It's and look, uh, it's going to cost a lot of money to do that. And you and at the end of the day, you're going to get a, just a general idea, Rick. But to be specific and say this point at this nature, you can't do that, Rick. Your blood pressure does this. Right. Your blood sugar does this all the time. You give it an average. That's right. the best we're going to do. I. I don't know why we have such a hard time. Look, we want it's we're too linear. We want to approach this linear, and nature is not linear. It doesn't work that way. No. That's just my opinion. Yeah, but let's go back. Let's go back to your idea, though. Of let's just talk corn and soybean acres for easy math. Right. Roughly ninety million. I mean, don't don't quote us here, folks. Roughly ninety million acres each one. So one hundred mil, one hundred eighty million acres. Well, first of all, Ray, we don't have enough seed to cover that many acres, and we don't no. have enough teachers to teach the folks to do those kind of acres. So, what would you what would you think would be a success in say, you know, if you were to get something like this implemented in three years, what would look what would success look like to you? Well, I tell you, I go by Dr. David Johnson. He said, you know, if we had thirty million acres or thirty percent of our land covered he felt that by these numbers, it would make a significant thing in the climate. It's, it would be good to, look, here's where we're at, Rick. 38% of the global surface on the earth is bare ground. It's either desertified or there's no vegetation. What's happening is the land can no longer, see, our bodies are self-healing, self-organizing, self-regulating. The planet is no longer doing that because there's not enough vegetation to offset not only the CO2 gases, which is not the biggest issue, but the water vapor. There's too much water vapor in the atmosphere. That's a bigger problem than the CO2. Yeah. That water vapor needs to be in a plant in the soil, the second largest reservoir of water, or the third. There's the ocean, the sky, and the soil. And so if we would just cover that and, and understand where we're at as a people, as a globe, you got to remember that even um, Saudi Arabia at one time was covered. They had elephants in Saudi Arabia, Rick. They found elephant tusks buried in the sands. The whole veg the whole planet was once vegetated. You know what came that finally came to that conclusion, and I felt comfortable, Rick, is when I went to Alejandro's ranch in Mexico. Yeah. When I saw the deserts become prairies, I said, uh, deserts are man-made for the most yeah. part. Yeah. Well, let's talk. I was going to go there, but let's do it now. I mean, Ray, we've all we've all read about this, you know, great stuff, but you gotta give you gotta walk us through here. I mean, how do you go from sand and hundred degree temperatures to what you have today? I mean, just give us some deep some more details. How how did you start? Well, I tell you what, uh when I first heard Ellen Savory speak, uh it was years ago, he did a um, a big um uh, TED talk. And it was interesting because I heard uh, Ellen speak in the 1990s, late 90s in, in Oregon. And I heard him speak and I go, man, this guy makes sense. Everybody else was pissed in the room because I wasn't a range con. 
but he made sense to me. And then I'll never, when I heard his TED talk and I saw those pictures, I said, that's fantastic. I, I believe it. But how do you do that? Like mm -hmm. you're talking about Rick, the, how yeah. do you do the logistics? Yeah. It, it, and look, I grew up in New Mexico. You got to remember, I'm the, I grew up in the fifth largest state in the union. It used, it's all desert now. It used to be a big prairie. I grew up in the, in the Rockies. I drive every day. I mean, I, I go see my parents. My parents still live there. And when I drive from Oklahoma to Texas to New Mexico, it's stark, bare, hot. The temperatures, when I went to college there, Rick, in Las Cruces, the temperatures in the soil would be 150, 160 degrees. You can fry an egg on the, on the, oh. on the, on the pavement. And oh. it's, that's how brutal the summers are. They get, it gets anywhere from 9 to 12, 13, 14 inches of rain. That's it. And I said, what are the cows going to eat? Because there's nothing out there. There's only mesquite and a lot of bare ground between the mesquite and creoso. They won't eat that. I said, they'll starve. What, how are they going to survive? And how are you going to restore the land with the cows? And how are you going to do it? Because there's no, you can't haul the hay in. There's a huge carbon imbalance and only plants can fix that. So right. it wasn't until three or four years ago when I went to Alejandro's ranch, I finally found out how they did it. The way they do it is you have to have infrastructure. Alejandro's got a 25,000 acre ranch, Las Damas. And they broke those to 300 paddocks, about 200 acres or the smaller, bigger. But they have water pipeline everywhere. They have 28 huge drinking troughs. They did this on their own, no government help, no cost share. So what they do is they take one part of the ranch where they may have some grasses and then they move the cattle during the, 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 the wet spring, the wet, the wet season when they get most of the rain during the rain time, they'll move that cattle from that paddock. And because they have the fence and the watering system, they can move the cattle to the other paddock, disrupt, uh, move and, and and bring up the break up the crust, poop, urinate, and they can move the cattle back and forth and kind of landscape them there. Then all of a sudden you get this ripple effect of grass starting to go more and more and more until the lands the the grassland starts. To, you start getting these islands, islands of grass surrounded by an ocean of desert, and it's and amazing how it's starting to grow. And Ray, this is this is natural. This is uh, grass that's inherent within that in that environment. Yes, it just, it's never, just been lost. Yeah, yeah. It never planted. They never planted yeah. any seed. It yeah. just woke up. The I call it the ecological memory. The seed bank is there, and they were able to stimulate it with manure, urine, break up the crust with the hoofs, yeah. and bring in and pulsate the animals back and forth, back and forth until now. Alejandro's got thousands and thousands of acres. And guess what? The feedback is he's getting more rain. He's getting more rain. And so he's got a picture of his side of the ranch getting rain. And the other side of the fence, there's no rain falling in the rain cloud. It, it's amazing and, and how it works. He's changed the weather. And it's changed the weather. Masanubu Fukuoka said, it's when he came, Masanubu Fukuoka, for the audience who doesn't know them, he's probably one of the best. There's a book called Seeding the Desert and One Straw Revolution. I definitely recommend those books. Mm -hmm. That man taught me a lot about ecology. And he came to the United States in the early 80s. And he said, quote, it was when I came to an American desert that I realized that the rain doesn't cease from not coming from the sky. But it ceases because there's no plants. And really, the rain comes from the ground, from the plants evaporating, transpiring. Yeah. He realized that rain comes from the ground up, right. not the other way around. And I said, wow, how profound. That's why, Rick, we're missing this. It's like what your hat says, plant green, farm yeah. green. It's right. that simple. Well, think about what he's also done to the temperature of that, of that profile. I mean, he's probably lowered it 40 degrees or, or yes. maybe more. Maybe more. Anybody that's gotten a, a little thermometer and, and moved vegetation and you go to the bare ground and then you go to the vegetation, it's 30, 40 degrees difference. Yeah. It's, and then you wonder, it creates his microclimates. And again, Rick, here's the thing we forget. Everything is connected. Everything from the ground to the microbe, to the plant, to the, 
microbes floating in the atmosphere. All this is one as a collective. That's why we're having such a problem getting it. We try to separate things out and it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. Um, let's go back to uh, to Tim. He said, "Great, this was on your 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 answer to his question earlier. A uh, great point on the covers of funding rate. I got one local producer who was heavy tillage annually to convert to no till and covers with seventy dollars an acre funding with no hesitation. I think some folks want the funds to help ease the transition since it is a big switch and learning curve for them. Totally yeah. agree. Totally agree. But yeah. we still have to have." that success factor that that farmer i don't care if you give him 500 dollars an acre he's got to have success that first time out and then his appetite starts to grow for it um yeah. if we don't have success and we and i don't like to use the word failure you 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 know me long enough ray i don't like that yep. word it's negative yep. but you know you need failures to get to get stronger too so we have to balance this out if, I tell you what, Rick, if people ask me, Ray, if you had one conservation practice that you could only do in the world, what would you do? Cover the soil, even more than no-till, as much as you and I love no-till, it would be cover the soil. It, that's the beginning of life. That's why I hate the name cover crops. I think cover crops should, we need a, a better name than cover crops. Co plants do way more than we have ever imagined. They're right. biological primers, nutrient sequesters, they're habitat. They're environment modifiers. They're, they're rain creators. They're, oh my goodness, where can we stop? Yeah. They, they do it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've got the wrong terminology on a lot of things. Um, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I do want to, I don't want to, I, I never know where we want to go here because uh, we need audience feedback, but let's go, let's go carbon markets again. Um, yeah. You know, it's just such a misnomer, right? I mean, why, why did we pick carbon, the element of carbon, to be the one? Why didn't we do um, water cycle, or why didn't we do soil health? That's the one I like. You know, let's get a soil health score, because yeah. let's face it. If if let, I don't care who you want to you want to pick out here, whoever's been whoever's in this regenerative world right now, mm -hmm. we're, we're for the most part not going to be able to play ball, because right. We're already doing everything that these programs are asking the people to do. So we're out. So how about we create a system that everyone can play ball? And like you said earlier, we need a spade, we need a hammer, and we need a ring, and we need two two cylinder tubes full of water. That's all we need. Yep. That's it. And and see the thing is, it, it's got to be simple. The reason Apple was so uh, effective, simplicity. It's yeah. got to be simple. Look, yeah. carbon is a very complex thing. And the reason it started that way, Rick, is when El Gore came out and he probably meant well. And I, and, and I think he meant well. And they started seeing those changes in the, uh, the islands of Hawaii and the top and say, hey, it's CO2 is creating. We're seeing this. Yes, all this is occurring. Yes. And But what we've done is then here's what we do. We focus on the minutia. It's kind of like, we 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 uh, swing in a gnat and swallow a camel. We focus on the things that are not are not going to make a huge difference. And we try to use machinery. We try to use other processes. But what the planet is really asking is, if you just cover it and, and just make it green right. in large surface areas, we can offset a lot. But people say, well, it can't be that simple. Well, here's the complex. Everybody's trying to make money through this whole process. Yeah. And then the message gets confused. And then the yeah. farmers don't realize. Look, farmers don't even understand the concept of carbon. Mm -mm. Most people in the United States don't understand, what are you talking about, carbon? What do you really mean? Right. I don't even understand all the uh, the nuances that we could talk about carbon. Yeah, I, I know. It, it's, you know, I know we've got, we've got Mitchell on, and Mitchell is deep into this carbon world, and it's just, you know, all I, my suggestion to folks is just, pull the reins in and let the dust settle a little bit and let's get a little better handle on what everyone's goal here is because you know what happens if if we get a system that is developed but yet 
a third of the buyers in the world don't like that system and they're not they're not going to buy from that system because they don't think it's fair for what for whatever reason so we just got to yeah. be careful and and slow down so um well, i don't really want to think if you want to say more about that that's fine i don't want to say a whole lot much more about carbon no. go ahead here's here's one thing i wanted to say one thing rick look the most one of the most complex things we're dealing with is with the human mind and the heart you're dealing when we're when we I realized when we added that last when I added the principle of context, mm -hmm. I realized that it's us that's the problem. It's the framework that we look at is causing a lot of our ecological issues. It's because we didn't we don't understand our own context. And I realized I didn't when I walked into a farm, I didn't I didn't take the farmer's context, I didn't take his cultural context into consideration, I didn't understand his social context, I didn't understand his economic context. I didn't really understand his ecological context. Right. And I didn't really understand his spiritual context and his goals, his personal life. And so when you, you're dealing with all these contextual things, you're not dealing with a machine. And yeah. I, I don't think scientists understand that. Right. We're dealing with living human organism here who right. thinks, and yeah. it makes it very complex. Yeah. And that's what, you know, I especially run into this because I'm a farmer. I go into Minnesota and they're like, what's this guy from Indiana trying to tell us how to farm in Minnesota? Well, that's not what I'm there to do. I'm there to explain that the, the principles of soil health work around the world. I don't care where yes. you are. Well, maybe yes. not Antarctica, maybe not Antarctica, but I don't care where you are. They are going to work. It's going to be in a different context. That's why this word context is so important. And, and Ray, you came up with this in what, 2014? Is that what you told me? 2006. 2006. 2006. Yeah, 2000... I used my power. I was, I was looking at one of my PowerPoints. Context was in 2006. Yeah. 2006. But it is so important because, yes, the folks that are in Minnesota are, are going to use different species than I'm going to use. So this is going to segue into a question we've got here. Right. Um, Again, I'm sorry, I, uh, Nico. Maybe I'm sorry. I, I don't. I don't know why. I don't see the whole Nicole? name. Nicole is it? Is it? Is it Nicole or no? Oh, Nicole. Okay. No, no. What would Ray recommend no, I, for those in heavy drought areas? So I get asked this a lot, Ray. You know, you're going to go to the high plains. They get eight yep. or nine inches of rain a year. Why in the world would we plant a cover crop in that environment and take all of our moisture away? Explain yep, to them how yep. wrong that is. Right. Look, uh, look, I came from a dry environment. I grew up in a dry environment. We, we only got, uh, you know, 10 or 11, 12 inches. And I lived in a, a dry valley. Look, and I, growing up in, in the Colorado, you know, that whole area, I know it very well. Look, it was a, let's, let's talk about ecological context. It was a prairie. It was covered 24 seven. The only way you're going to make it in those dry areas, here it is whether people like it or not, you have to have animals in the system. You have to have animals in the system so that when you use the living covers, you graze that, let it recharge, but you're moving your rotations. If you want to plant wheat or do that, you, you have, because these places usually are thousands of acres. But what we do is we plant a monoculture on the, all the thousand acres, but we don't give, we don't create a tapestry of life with diff different diverse animals. So when you're bringing animals into that system, what it allows you is time for mm. recovery to recharge. So, but you cannot make that system work without living plant 24 seven, not gonna work and a grazing animal. Sorry, I, I, I can't fix it any other way. And so if you want to crop in that area, you need to understand you know, for resilience and to recover and to recharge, You've got to have proper rotations, lots of carbon, and the right animal. You got to have grazing animals. Sorry, don't work. It will yeah. not work without grazing animals. Now, uh, Dr. Beck and the guys in the Dakotas, they're doing a really good job. Not bring, you know, a lot of them do have animals in the system, but there's some of them, but they're doing rotational intensity, very intercropping, polycropping, things that use very little water no-till covers all the principles we talked about rick and i talk, talk about yeah but to me you cannot make it really thrive without the grazing animals period i just don't and, see it and and you've got to lay out diverse 
packages of cocktails here too. I mean, you have to have multi species. Yes. Yeah. yeah, because see, these multi species, um, they collaborate more than than, and they're not as competitive because they all bring something to the mix. They all have different canopy size, different architecture, different roots. They collaborate with the, through the fungi, so uh, synergy, and they and they cover that soil and they use less water. And yeah. uh, and so we've 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 known that for a while. Yeah, and and I think also when you bring those livestock on, you're now starting to build that mat, that armor that is yeah. now going to cover that soil because you know you know Jimmy Emmons, I, I love his answer. Uh, you know, the, the, a, a big storm comes through or whatever, and his neighbor calls and says, how much rain did you get? And Jimmy says, well, I got it all because he's worked on his soil. He's got good infiltration rates and it's going in yeah. his soil, not running off. Right. So all right. that's important. I think one of the things too, I think that I've been starting to say, Rick, with, and I, when I start teach, look, there's, we talk about, like in, you talked about Antarctica. Well, Antarctica, and I tell people, is this the moon? Even Antarctica has microbes. <laughs> There's microbes in Antarctica. This whole planet is covered with life. And so I tell people, look, there's four things that producers really need to focus about what they got to do on their operation. They got to capture sun. That's light energy. The other process is without the living plants, there is no water cycle, period. Uh, let's make that very clear to the audience. Yeah. No plant. No soil, no water cycle. In other words, the plants help regulate the water cycle. In fact, if we had no plants on this planet, we have rock and ice, it'd be dead. Yeah. Capturing sun, have a functional water cycle on your place, and then, then have a fun and then we get a nutrient cycle. And then it is all driven by this one thing called the diversity of life. I call it the software of the planet. The more diverse our farms and ranches, our animals, insects, and living plants the more it works better. Like I tell people, look, your iPhone is worthless without software. The software yeah. of the planet is life, diversity of organisms. So the more diverse your rotations, your organisms and that, the better your system works. Right. Here yet. I think we make it too hard. So when we go out there and I tell, when I walk on a farm, Rick, I first thing I said, how much living, how much bare ground do I see? Because if I see bare ground, that's telling me, oh my gosh, you're, you're spilling sun. You're not building aggregates. You've got probably a dysfunctional water cycle, overgrazing, nutrient cycle. Do you see how all these things, four basic things fit together? Make it oh, simple. Yeah. 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 It, Ray, you're, you're awesome because you j you're so passionate about this and you've taken something that we want to make so complex and you just bring it down and make it very simple. Just follow the, the six principles of soil health and, and, and we'll be in good shape. It's, it's just that simple. I'm a simple boy, Rick. I, yeah. I I teach for my I teach for my level below fifth grade, well, because look, it, it, I, I'm, it's true. Fifth grade, look, we make it too complex, Rick. Yeah. And, and I think we make it too complex. And to me, if I I I used to make it too complex too, Rick. I you know, I used to say, well, you got to bring animals in every situation. No, you know what I've learned, Rick. You got to take a person where they're at. And and some people are at a very basic level, and that's okay. Yeah, it's the attitude. If you're yeah. moving, did you stop one more spray? Did you add one more cover? Those, that's where I'm at right now with people. I just take them where they're at. Yeah. Uh, let's see what. Um, something. Else. Oh, I want to talk about human health now for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me, tell me what what you think the the correlation or the synergy is between soil health and and human health. It was interesting. I was there was a book called "Soil Organisms and Higher Plants" that was given to me by a, a, a hippie guy in Vermont. I'd never forget it. It was written by the a Russian uh, scientist. Most people don't realize, Rick, that the the some of the best soil microbiologists in the world in the early 1930s, 1900s, were the Russians. They had some of the most brilliant. In fact, the father of soil microbiology, I think it's been this he is Russian. But the reason I'm bringing that up is when I read that book the first time it was translated, it was a Jewish person that translated it from, uh, from Russian to English. And it was beautiful. I'll never forget reading that. As I was reading that book, it was talking about the Russians were talking about how 
they could show that when they added manures into the soil, that the vitamin A would increase in the wheat and vitamin Bs would increase in the wheat. And, and they, could, they could detect that in the 1930s and 40s. They had the ability to see that nutrient density would change in, yeah. the, in the plant itself. And so, uh, and here we get all excited about it, but I start laughing. They started knowing this stuff in the 30s. Yeah. And, yeah. and so it was really cool. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah, I mean, often I'll stand up and say, you know, we're, we haven't invented anything new here. We're just bringing back to the surface things that we've forgotten. So yep. uh, great point. What was the name of the book again, right? It's called, it's called um, Soil Organisms and Higher Plants. Soil yeah. Organisms and Higher Plants. It's on PDF file. It's Actually, you can get it for free. It's one of the best soil microbiology books I've ever read. And um, I'm trying to remember the author's name. I'll try to see if I can remember by the end of the day. But, but that book really, I read it several times, Rick, because yeah. it taught me a lot about some of the research they were doing back there and how powerful microbes were back then. And it's called Soil Organisms and Higher Plants. Yeah, well, have, I've not read it. that one. I'll have to get that one. Um, yeah, Google it, and somebody will Google it, and then and then bring it up to the the, uh, the group here. But it was it was written in the nineteen uh, early nineteen thirties, and um, and it was published, I think, in the sixties, probably. But it was a great book. Yeah, and and you know, Ray, I, I you know where I stand on this, but we we can't have human health unless we have soil health first, and and you know, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I I I. I've absolutely been a hypocrite to my to myself. I mean, I focused my whole life on building soul health. I wasn't taking care of my own body. And as a result of that, I'm a type two diabetic. So, uh, no. you know, luckily I've, I've got a good, my beautiful wife, Carol, uh, takes care of me the best she can. I mean, but Ray, when we're on the road uh, talking and teaching, it's hard. It's hard to get good quality, healthy food. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Gabe and I talked. Gabe and I talked that what's going to kill us is the food. <laughs> yeah, as we travel the whole country, it's the food, Rick. Yeah, yep, yep. But you're you know, exactly right, Rick. I, it's there. Hey, Rick, real quick. Uh, yeah, I just put a link. I just put a link on the on the book. It's on Amazon. Okay. It's called Soil Organisms and Higher Plants by Eskinov. N A Eskinov. Okay. Yep. Yeah, it's a great right. book. I put the link there and it's soil microorganisms and higher plants. Well, well worth getting that book. All right. We'll get her. We'll get her. But, you know, change, you know, I'll, I always say change is good. Change is hard. Change is good. But, you know, I've changed my life. I've changed my, my eating. I've exercised a, a little, not enough, but I do try to exercise. So no more insulin, no more metformin. I've, I'm trying to control my sugar with just diet. And we can do the same thing. We can, we can look at these fields and this soil in the exact same way. Yes. Uh, and, and, yeah. and, and, and I want to go somewhere here in just a minute, but I want to go back. Um, I think it's Nicole again. When you both speak, this all seems so clear and obvious, yet we have very low adoption of these practices. Why? What can we do to change that? Well, go ahead, Ray. I mean, we've already touched on this some, but but go ahead again and, and give, give your thoughts on that. Well, look, guys, look, look what happened. Um, let's just be frank about what happened the last year or so. When a certain narrative is pushed, look how, how our country went down uh, the word, you know, with the, with the COVID and all that. It took and and fear and with humans and misinformation how it took off like wildfire. Now think yeah. about when go back in the 1930s and 40s when um, more people were going into the city and leaving the farm, and then fertilizer kicked kicked in. Fertilizer was being made, pesticides mm -hmm. were being made, and you you got to think about all these factors coming in and the situation that created this. Um, where we're at, it was not just one singular event. It was many, many events that led to where we're at as a country and as a people. And so in our health and everything. So I've, I've said this many times. There's two things that are killing us. 
Big Pharma, F-A-R-M-A, and then P-H-A-R-M-A, and they control both sides. It's about, it's about, it's about chemicals. It's about selling. It's about money. It's not about no longer about life or about the people or about, it's about selling things. And, and that's the brutal reality. And, and it's very hard to bust that narrative because it's, you're dealing with people's uh, livelihood. And then we all know what happens. It's called the Stockholm syndrome, Rick. Yeah. We'll protect, we all protect our own territory. Yeah. We all don't want to be wrong. Again, it all comes back in this one thing, human nature. That's the issue we're dealing with. Right. And and I think, you know, I think what to 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 also add to that to Nicole's question, I, I hope it's Nicole. Um, you know, we just we need everyone like like Ray and, and all the other folks and myself and all the other we just need to continue to just beat the streets and 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 speak at these conferences and and speak to the uh, the uh, SWCD folks, the NRCS, you know, whoever these groups are, and and just keep teaching and and helping and spreading the word because eventually, you know, the folks are going to say, you know, I've heard this guy talk about this twenty times. Let's just see what this is all about. And I'm telling you, it, yeah. it only you just have to get started. Because if yep. you just get started and have success, you can't wait for the next season to get here so you can try another 500 acres. Yep. So it, yep. Yep. you just have to get that 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 started. Let me tell you a story, uh, Rick. It was in, it, I, just before you start the next one, Rick, it was interesting. I was in Minnesota about two months ago, and a, a producer comes up to me and he says, Ray, they had a panel, and I hadn't been to about, Minnesota in about four or five years to go teach in some groups. And he said to me, Ray, when I first heard you, I thought you were insane. Mm -hmm. I thought you were crazy. I, I don't know how many people told me, Ray, yeah. we thought you were crazy. Yeah. And so we did it. And, the, and the, that person did what you just said, Rick. He started planning covers. He stood up in front of the whole group. And that's why when I go do these, these workshops, I love doing it with people like Rick or another work, farmer. That farmer stood up in front of those 100 people that were there. And he says, he told him exactly. I said, I met Ray. I thought he was insane. I thought he was crazy. Mm -hmm. He says, now. Guess what? Since I started using covers, and I've been no-till for a long time, but now he says I net five hundred dollars an acre on my farm. Yeah, he said he stood that and told that to everybody. Yeah, yeah, and that was that's what it takes when somebody yeah. speaks out like that in a group. Yeah, and nothing against you, Ray, but that was a farmer talking to other farmers, and he was that yes. proof that verified. Yeah solidified everything you were talking about so exactly. hopefully that that helps uh nicole maybe you can get a i don't know i'm not sure where you are but maybe you can get a farmer led group in your area um so anyway let, i'm going to read something here from matt I, again i can't I, all i got is l-o-r-e matt lawrence matt okay. lawrence we we transitioned our southern indiana farm to covers and no-till over the past two years after a year in a carbon program, I was told this week that we will not qualify because their imagery analysis says that our our winter river bottom volunteer growth of wild onions and wild grass is cover crops, and our new cover crops are not addition are not additionality. I have spent quite a bit of time trying to meet their moving data endpoint target, and this seems to be the final pain that will cause me just to forget it. And it's about 10 bucks an acre. This is exactly what we've been talking about. Yeah. This yeah. system is not geared toward the benefits of everyone involved yet. So I we told need to just hold back. Just hold back. Right. And I'm telling you what, I had a producer tell me, Ray, should I get in involved in caution? I said, no. I said, because look, it's going to be more painful than it's worth. It depends on the on the local district conservationists, and that can make a huge difference. But the reality is, until and see those kind of things like that that little diatribe that he had to deal with those minutia, whether the wild onions or not, yeah. the wild grass. Who cares? It's a living cares? root it's... feeding exudates yes. with the other covers. What's the big deal? Right. It, it, it's right. just like it's so now. If the covers are growing along with it, why should it matter? Yeah. And and so and I, I think it's very frustrating, and and we're see what happens when I, I was a government employee, and it was hard. It's you have to think and you're willing to be take a risk, 
and you're willing to stand up. Mm -hmm. If you're a leader and you want to send us, no, I verify it because and document it, they'll do it. But you have to have a person in that local office that does that. Yeah. You necessarily don't have that. Well, I'll tell you what would have frustrated me the most, Ray, with working for the government would be the, the slowness of how change occurs. I mean, it's like trying to change a big battleship. You know, you can't you can't just turn that thing around. It takes it takes a long time to change direction. So yep, it does. that's that's part of the problem. And and, you know, gosh, there's so much we could talk about. We haven't even talked about the high the high price of inputs and all the more reason for a farmer to be implementing these practices because now we can reduce their our synthetic load, which is instant yep. savings. Yep. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, let, let's let's head toward the finish line here, Ray. Let's what what's Ray doing now and and what do you what's Ray want to do? Uh, teach. Uh, that's what I love to do is teach. I and I still teach. I, I still promote Soil Health Academy. I still promote Understanding Ag. Um, I still promote uh, Rick Clark and other groups, Regen Ag. I promote, look, I'm about building relationship and, and that's what I want to do. Uh, continue uh, this message of teaching because the reality, that's the biggest problem right there is between the years. I, I, I do not want to lose focus. A lot of people want, you can, you can go down, chase a, bun, a bunch of a bunny rabbit holes. And I'm not going to do that. I'm 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 60 years old, Rick, and yeah. I want to get to the point. I don't want people. I don't like wasting people's time, and I don't want them wasting my time. I know what the goal is. Mimic the natural system. I teach my whole jo my whole goal is to teach that and continue to teach that, and and it's going really well. Uh, the thing is, I I want to do it at a more uh, uh, softer pace. You know, like Gabe and, and Ellen, those guys are work animals and Shane. They put. If people knew how many hours those guys put it's amazing I, I i have a farm here and i want to slow down and i don't want to put as many hours but i want to pace myself yeah. and i also got my family life i think people you've got to have a balanced family life at your home and, and there's a saying that i love to say what good is if you save the world if you lose your own soul no yeah. you know so you got to get things in perspective yeah. in your own family and your home your own life so i just want to uh, pace myself and enjoy life. Yes. You yeah. know, I got to uh, you, you enjoy you and your wife when we went to Phoenix or and travel. You know, even though you, I don't know how many, I don't know how much you travel, Rick, but I know you probably travel more than I do now. Yeah, but you, you travel a lot. Yeah. And so I guess it's balance. I mean, we're, we're one thing I, I got to tell about this generation, Rick, that I love. I watch people like your daughter, my daughter, and this younger like Mitch, Aura, and all these other young people and Russell. But you know what I'm beginning to realize, like my daughter's teaching me in this generation, the younger generation, that it's not always just about work, but it's about it's about having a purpose. Yeah. And that's really cool. I really like because my time my daughter uh, told me, she says, Dad, she was given a, a good job in Boeing. She was in the military for a couple of years as a lieutenant. She said, Dad, I can't stand working for Boeing anymore. I got to have a job with purpose. And so I see hope in our next generation because you think about it, Rick, 70% of millennials read labels. Yeah. 70%. They're, they're not like us, like grew up in the, I grew, I'm, a, I'm a baby boomer. And thank goodness for some of these thought process that's going on. It's not always about work. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. Hey, we've got, uh, we've got Willie Petoris is out there. Willie, how you doing? Um, we need to read his comment here. Uh, be careful about oversimplifying the soil health to human health issues. The plant has to obtain several nanonutrients, parentheses David Johnson, from the unobtainable mineral fraction through mycorrhizal connectivity, which are part of the coenzymes to synthesize some very important phytochemicals. Without this connectivity, you will not get this reaction. I fail to understand how the rush to certify regeneration without taking this into account. Willie, that is an excellent point, and I'm gonna go right into that. Ray, I am thoroughly convinced that we are losing our association to mycorrhizal fungi with these 
current genetics that we are hand, asked to, to use of corn and soybeans and maybe even other, other, other crops. But I, I don't have proof of this, but here's what I do know. I, I do put test plots out. And when I put these test plots out into our system, which is organic with no tillage, no, no synthetic inputs of any kind, all of the latest and greatest genetics are at the bottom of every test plot every single time. That can yeah. only tell me that we have now either lost or are losing that association. And now these, these crops are solely dependent on synthetic fertilizers and tillage. What do you think? Well, one thing too, Rick, look, this is not, this is not new, really. Some of the stuff that we've known, like, like the book I was just telling you about the Russians, they knew a lot of these, about these molecules. And I knew about five or six, seven year ago, years ago that it was about these photochemicals that Willie's talking about. Uh, we focused a lot on micronutrients. That's what we did in, that, in these, these zinc and those minerals. But case in point, uh, uh, Dr. Liebig, he, he, he was the one that uh, went down this path. He said, hey, I can create, I mean, he's such a brilliant scientist, yes. But he, he thought he could make his own baby formula. He thought I can put all the uh, trace minerals and do all these other things, just like a chemistry set. And I can do just exactly as good and create baby formula, just as good as mama's breast milk. Failed miserably. The kids started getting sick. It's because those molecules that only life can produce. It's, soil is not a chem, is, there's geology. Those nutrients are geology. Without life, plants and microbes taking those minerals out of the rock, those trace minerals, but it's more powerful than that. It's what the plants also, those molecules of the plants and the microbes and the byproducts. We've known that. And, we're, and, and Willie bring, is bringing up a point about that, that whole factor and the complexity of it. Right. I'm just, what you and I are talking about is there is a direct link and it is a, a, and it's a link that's been known for a while. It's, mm -hmm. and, and the more we get our sophisticated analysis, but let's, I want to make one quick thing, Rick. Let's not think just because we have more sophisticated uh, machinery that some of the scientists didn't know some of this years ago. Read the book of soil microorganisms and higher plants. They knew some of this stuff ago and they didn't have the sophisticated stuff that right. Willie's talking about. Right, right. Yeah. But they knew no, some of this. It, 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 it wasn't like... Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I finished. I finished. Yeah. No, we, yeah, we're, we're not... We're not inventing new stuff here. We're just bringing back stuff that we've forgotten about and, and we've just misplaced. So um, all right, a couple comments, uh, Mitchell, the purpose is to carry on the good work of you guys and the generation ahead of us, Ray. We have a lot of work to do, but as farmers, we must focus on being the shepherds of God's creation. I mean, that's, that's wonderfully said. Uh, yeah, th yeah. Th thank you, Mitchell. Go ahead, Ray, comment on that. Well, it, uh, Mitch, that's the whole purpose. That's why you hit it. Look, that's why we recently created a trailer that on, 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 um, to touch Christians because look, there's 1 billion professing Christians, Rick, throughout the globe. And I was always saying, okay, if we just talk to farmers and we're never gonna fix this problem, we gotta take it to all kinds of groups. So we created a, we, uh, it's gonna be coming out in the next month or so, a couple of months. We created a 12 minute trailer on how regeneration of the healing of the planet and how the churches also had some doc doctrinal issues that they couldn't defend or people had a problem with the Christian Bible. For example, uh, Dr. White, Lynn White wrote a paper in 1961 saying that Christianity is the reason why the, the globe's in bad shape. That's the paper and he wrote it, this, this narrative and it came out, it was published. And if you read the paper for what it's saying, you could see his point that some of that is true. But again, the reason was it was a wrong paradigm, wrong view of how they interpret the scriptures about how uh, he thought that God said, hey, I'm gonna, uh, I want you to subdue the planet. I want you to take control of it. But he thought, well, I can force it, control it. God gave me charge, but he forgot the love part. You forgot to tell him, no, you're supposed to do it the way I do it. Yeah. You love the creation. And yeah. I think people forget that. And so what we're saying now is 
that's what stewardship is. You know why you do what you do, Rick? I'll tell you why. You know why you go traveling all over the and you go away from Carol and all that and you put all those hours? Because you love people in the land. Mm-hmm. It's just as simple as that. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. Love is that land. When you love that land and you care for it, that's what we're talking about. That's that stewardship. It's yeah. not controlling and beating it up. And I think there was a misinterpretation of that. And that's why stewardship is so important in this whole conversation. That's why we created this 12-minute trailer that will be coming out in a couple of months that um, we can enforce so how we can get Christians to be more involved. Because if you go to the Bible South and you go to the other people that profess Christianity, they can see be some of the most destroyed soil land. Yeah. And so we, we got to fix that. And right. so – What's happening is what the Bible's telling us what to do and what's happening in real life in our in our Christian walk is not matching. So we're trying to fix that. Yeah. Yeah, well that's great. Um Ray, there's so many things we didn't touch on, but I want to I want to just go to one more spot. I mean, we've been in this uh, uh, over an hour and a half now. Um kiss the ground. This was this was this the timing was good. This needed to be done. The message was great. Give us the, you know, how long were you on this project? Was it five, six years? I mean, what was it from beginning to end? What was it like? You know, the, the, the producers came to you. We want to do this. Did you like the way it ended? Give us the whole, the whole, the whole elevator's pitch. Uh, Rick, to be honest, it was, you know, that most people don't realize it took seven years to get that film out. Seven. Over seven years, seven years to get that film out. When I remember when I met the Kiss the Ground group people, young young people, I um, they were a group of young people and very exuberant in California and people that really care about the land and care about the people. And I said, and they asked me that before they would, we they said, well, we heard about your work that you go around teaching soil health and you use your demonstrations and stuff like that. And we we want to film you. We want to get involved and I get to know you and blah blah blah. And I looked at them. I was very cautious. I said. I said, look, look, the only way I was going to get involved with you, I said, look, I'm just going to be brutally honest. You need to understand you're dealing with a group of people that think very differently from you and maybe politically or whatever, socially yeah. than you. But if you're willing to approach them in humility and to willing to listen and willing to, uh, again, be patient and listen to what they're going to teach you and, and learn and understand their paradigm. And they were willing to do that. And they did. And they fought and they came to some of them came to our schools in the Soul Health Academy. And then this filming started happening. And to be honest to you, Rick, I, I didn't think much of it because I, I said, OK, kiss the ground. This, I knew with Josh because I saw some of his video uh, movies in the past. I didn't think any of it. I thought it was just kind of like a passing thing. Yeah. And that was never going to see the day of light, Rick. I'm going to be brutally honest. In fact, it took so long that I had given up on it. And I'll never forget no, hey, the tail end because I, yeah. Go ahead. Let me interrupt you just for a second here. When this started, you were a, a USDA employee. Is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It was. If you see the movie, I still had an NRCS logo on. Yeah. There. It yeah. was. Yeah, because I retired in 2016, and that play videoing play happened. If you go seven years back, what well, was uh, 2014 or something like that, or, or something like yeah. that, it was. No, it was, and we were, and so, yeah, it was way back then, and I was still a government employee, and I'm going to tell you, I'm so glad it came out late, Rick, because I would have probably got in trouble over it. I didn't ask permission to go watch some filming. I didn't know, look, I walk, go around most of my life aimlessly, my wife will tell you, kind of, ee, you know, and didn't realize the impact of that videoing when they were doing it, but let me tell you, I saw four versions of that movie before it came out. And the four versions were okay, but they weren't great. And yeah. and then, and I said, and Gabe and I made it very clear to Josh. I said, Josh, if you're going to do this movie, first we weren't going to be in the movie because we thought it was going to be an organic vegan movie. And I said, nah, and it's going to be hate the animals. And I, I, we didn't want to be part of that. Yeah. But we told Josh, but I really believed in Josh. And I think Josh grew through this whole journey. And I got to give Josh and, and, Ray, and, Rick, and his wife, Rebecca, credit because they a lot of the funders wanted this kind of movie but josh was able to convince and and really bring that masterpiece that he did and and because he he listened to what gabe and i were telling him and said 
Josh, please understand, if you don't give people hope, I don't want to be in it because I hate yeah. environmental movies are depressing. Number two, that it glorifies the animal, the, the glory that it deserves. So we, it had to be do all that. He did it. And finally, the last part of it was that the it got turned back down many times because they said it doesn't have story. You got a bunch of talking heads, a bunch of scientists, boring. That's not going to work. So then they focused the story around me at the initially following me all over in this crusade to help heal the soil. And that's how that worked. Yeah. And so they had to because they didn't have a story flow and there was no story to it. And then finally, the last part of it, thank God for COVID in some ways. Yes, there were some positive things of COVID. I, I think sometimes we always just look at the things of, yes, a lot of people died. A lot of people got hurt. A lot of money was lost. Yes, there was tragedy. But also in tragedy, there are rays of hope. It forced people to stay home and watch that documentary. And they were so bored out of their skull that for them to pick up a documentary like Kiss the Ground and watch it, yeah. it millions and millions of views. I was one billion impressions. It did really well in Netflix. And it, it needed to happen because I don't think, Rick, so many people came to me crying, had tears in their eyes. I don't know how many people have said, Ray, I have hope now. Mm -hmm. When they saw that documentary, they said, I have hope. We can fix this. Rick, do you know how that means to me? Oh, and yeah. And what it's meant to a lot of people. There was a story about a young person in Australia who watched the movie, changed some of his farming operation. Yeah. Well, So the well, movie well, had a huge impact. I don't know how to thank you. I mean, we can't thank you and Gabe enough. I mean, the message that you sent there, we're so glad that you, you stayed with it. I mean, my gosh, seven years, you probably just, you know, threw the towel in almost and said, it's over. Oh, I did. But thank I, goodness I, you, you, you know, plowed forward and you made it. You know, you didn't let, well, I don't know how I want to say this, but you, you made sure the movie was done the correct way, not the way that it was wanted to be done. Let, let's just leave it yeah. at that. Well, and Finian, and, and look, there was people like Finian and Ryland and Josh. I got to give Josh. Josh grew, Rick. Boy, Josh and Rebecca grew through this whole process, and they saw, <laughs> well, maybe it isn't just about organic. It's yeah. much deeper than that. And they saw that. So there's a lot of people that got credit for it, but I tell you what, Rick, I thought it was going to fail flat. Yeah. I didn't think we was going to see the daylight at all. And those young people pushed Netflix. They pushed him to the net. Now people like I heard room. I heard that um, um, a lot of movie stars saw it. In fact, there was rumors that even um, um, uh, Microsoft uh, mogul, what's his name? Uh, um, oh. Um Gates yeah. saw it, and then, I, I okay. never heard any. There was any any feedback about that, but a Bill lot Gates. of very oh, yeah. And you know who saw it? Prince Charles. Prince yeah. Charles. A lot of people saw the movie. Yeah. In fact, that's and that's why we got to talk. I never would have talked to the Secretary of Agriculture if it wasn't for the movie. Yeah. Well, thank thank you for doing that, Ray. Because and Gabe, uh, I'll have to thank Gabe personally because it, it was. Very well done, and the timing was perfect. So, again, thank you so much. Oh, um, man, Rick. You're welcome. Yeah. I, it's all of us to give us a team. Yeah, yeah. Um, Charlotte Hendrickson, uh, please provide instructions regarding how to view the Christian video when it's released. The faith leader I'm collaborating with will be grateful for such a resource. Thanks for sharing this impactful wisdom. So, do you have a website? Ray or where's not it yet. Be? You know what? Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna create it. It's gonna be up in a couple of it's gonna be in a couple of months. We're almost done with it, Charlotte. We're almost done with it. And um in fact, um what you be the best thing to do is let me give you uh Rick, you know, when do you guys collect information for the uh, um when people uh, uh, what I can do is I'll type my my email. And then uh, in about a month or two, contact me. There it is. And then we're going to have it. And then we're going to, there it is. There's my yeah. email, Charlotte. And then about a month or so, let me know. And then we'll let it out because we're going to release it pretty soon. And I've been very pleased because we're trying to debunk the, the old concept of dominion. And when you guys, when you get a chance, 
read that paper by, I think it's named Lynn White, 1961, and about how Christianity, if you look at about type Christianity, Lynn White, 1961, you'll see that paper come up about how it was very critical against Christianity. But it, and, and what I think what Dr. Lynn White was trying to say is that cu the current doctrinal understanding of dominion is absolutely wretched. Uh, control, force, and look at what we've done with the planet. And so his point is valid, but he, I think he missed the point that and a lot of people have missed it. Well, no, God said, uh, you're supposed to do it in love. Like you're supposed to be my ambassador. I am yeah. a God of love. You're supposed to love the animals. You're supposed to love, where's the love part? <laughs> and I think they, they left that narrative out. So, but uh, well, I'll let you, yeah, we'll do that. We'll show that. Well, Ray, what what's so refreshing about you is you just you just say it the way it is and that uh, that's so refreshing because everyone knows exactly where you stand they they know what you're thinking there is no animosity and it's very refreshing and and you're not you're not putting anybody down you're just giving it to us the way we need to hear it and and thank, thank you very much thank you rick i think one of the book that helped me do that was uh, reading my bible it taught me how to be to be more like Christ-like to when you talk to people, uh, you do it in love and patience, yeah. and kindness, and and understand in the way Christ did. He approached everybody from the most wretched sinners to the most arrogant uh, of all the society. He he approached them, but I think that's what we got to do, Rick. What we when I've learned when I walk on a farm, it's the most honoring thing when a person asks me to their farm. That's like asking me to sit in their living room, Rick. Mm -hmm. They're asking me into their own life. Yeah, I, I always took that as a great honor. Yeah. When a farmer invites me to their farm, they're asking me into their life. I yeah. said, wow, what an honor. And, and so when you, when you think of it that way, you do it with a lot of, you try to be a lot more humble and a lot more uh, and, and reverence to that, that honor. So yeah. that's why I liked it. And that's why we, all of us in the regenerative ag movement, what I see is that we have a lot of people that are lovers and givers. They give. They're, they share their knowledge. Yeah. And I, I'm just, uh, I wish I could just be a better example, but there's a lot of people that are just way better example than I. I'm excited to be around them. Yeah. Well, you know, there's, there, we've had a lot of great feedback from the audience. I can't thank you enough. Um, these You're recordings... Welcome. Every one of these podcasts we've done have been recorded. They will soon be launched out on probably YouTube and Apple. So just stay stay following Farm Green 13 on social media, and we'll give you updates on when you can get. Because we've had oh my gosh, the speakers we've had, and Ray, you just you just blew it out of the water here tonight. Uh, we talked about so Thank many you, different things that that see that's what this is about. I, I don't want to just just talk soil you know all the time we got to talk about right. the whole right. the whole package and yeah. and ray i'm going to give right. you the, the last couple minutes here how do you want to wrap this up what, what do you what do you want to say to close it here's what i want to say rick look folks what we need is leaders and what the the little things we do every time you move those sheep a little more one more field you've done a great thing for the planet the more you put a cover, the more you do to know to the moment you don't put a seed coating and you did it consciously because you you're you you're concerned about the organisms. It's the little things you do will make a huge impact that I call it that little butterfly effect of create a tornado of change. You do make a difference. Every one of you in the audience, you make a huge difference. The way you re approach people, the way you communicate, the way you farm. Even if it's just an acre, if yeah. it's a lot, you're yeah. making, I, I think we don't understand. Once you understand connectedness, Rick, that we're all so intimately connected, mm -hmm. we're all related to each other. We're all brothers and sisters. We're all family. And then how everything's absolutely connected. And you used to think about, well, that's kind of like this weird Eastern cultures. No, 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 no. Quantum physics is teaching that. All of yeah. it's connected. So what you guys do out there, not just me and Rick, you know, all of you make a difference. And, and I want to thank you guys and your community that you're by yourself out there and you feel you're alone. You're not. You're part of us. You're part of this beautiful, connected community so that Rick and I are here to share you people like Russell or 
Rick Haney and the Liz Haney and all these people, uh, Gabe and all these people, we're all connected. And we're, we, we're there to help you out. Yeah. I just want to let you know that you're not by yourself. Yeah. Well, Ray, this has been an absolute honor. Thank you for, for coming on to this podcast. It's been a blast. And oh my gosh, you I mean, Ray, we're going to have to do this again because you have too much knowledge in your brain. Uh, we've got to get more of it out. So um, don't be surprised. I won't be tapping you on the shoulder to do another one of these in the near future. So thank you, Ray. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you for doing this podcast, Rick, and for yeah. what you do. You're and welcome. all you pen. Good night, all of you guys. Blessings to you all. Hey, thank you, everyone. Uh, everyone have a great week. Ray, thank you. And uh, everyone be, be good. Thank you much. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.